Welcome back to the Panzer Museum in Munster and our part two of the special that we have going on where I am annoying Hillary with strange and wonderful questions as we are clambering over, around, down or through the Panzer IV. Okay, so we have clambered into the three-man turret of the Panzer IV. I've come in through the commander's hatch. It's actually kind of a narrow squeeze, and Hillary has come in through the, the multiple doors. There's a lot of doors on this thing. Yes, each crewman has a door. Was that a requirement or just something that they There's decided? A specification from the beginning. Each man would have his own exit and entry position. Well, that was awfully thoughtful of them. So this, uh, the Panzer IV, of course, late 1930s, we're talking about a powered three-man turret, which is fairly advanced thinking compared to what other people were doing at the time. Uh, again, was this was a Waffenop requirement or just something? Yes, uh, uh, it was an electrical drive turret. It had its own special engine for just driving the turret. To electrics um, and the power to reverse could uh, give you three to sixty degrees in thirty three seconds. It's not bad for the time, uh, and it's a it's a full platform as well, so your legs aren't going to get caught on anything major. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at the commander's position itself, of course, the, the Germans also were very early into the cupola business. Any particular stories behind that, or just say, hey, let's let's build something with five of these vision blocks. No, uh, but the French had already exper experience in the cupolas as well, so maybe they picked it up from there. Mm, yeah, for, I, I wasn't overly impressed by the French cupolas, okay. that has to be said. <laughs> <laughs> the things where you kind of rotate with your helmet and it's god awful. But uh, anyway, so there are five cupolas with the glass blocks behind, and I do note that they can open and close a little bit, which is kind of clear. Oh, I've locked it in place. So it's a full close, a half open, and a full open with a pointer to my direct front. Together with, uh, this is one of the earliest uh, azimuth indicators mm -hmm. on a cupola that I can think of. Um, the other, of course, interesting point about this tank is that the commander is behind a very large gun that is recoiling towards the most important part in the tank. A little Correct. disconcerting. Yes. Now, presumably, the original short 75 wasn't going to endanger the family jewels as much. No, 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 not as much. It wouldn't have recoiled as far. It's obviously when they put put in the long gun, they had to take more space, and they didn't, didn't redesign the turret to, to do this. Simple spent shell casing bag. Um, one nice thing about this design, though, is that you don't have the commander and the gunner crammed one behind the other and trying to take up that little, you get a lot more room for the two, yes. uh, the two operators. So, so you, I guess you get more advantage out of that turret ring. Uh, I, I think it was, uh, uh, certainly when the short uh, gun was available, you had short cartridges uh, for the uh, loader to handle and so forth. Very plenty of space for the loader here. Hmm. Uh, so, radio access. The commander could transmit on the radio. There was electrical communications, presumably from here, so he could talk direct to whoever. This, this was the first of the Panzer IVs where there was an intercom permanently available. So uh, before then? Before then, it, it was an intercom available when they weren't using the radio um, or they were using a voice tube between the commander and the driver. Not quite sure how that would work if the turret is turned. I wasn't at that meeting. <laughs> but you have you can tap the shoulders of the uh, gunner and so forth. You can communicate very easily with him. Fair enough. Um, okay, so this was a Tropen tank. So this vehicle is driving around in North Africa and it's a bit warm. Did the Tropen modification include any sort of additional cooling systems? Yes, the... Um, for the, the people, sorry, for yeah, the people. The, the, there's behind you there, there's a vents into the engine compartment, uh, so it could draw air from the vehicle out. And that was only on the Tropens? Yeah. Okay, convenient yeah. enough. And, and there's a, a fan for fume extraction, which is missing on this particular vehicle. Okay, so that would help. So it wasn't yep. too god awful, and well, I guess you could just open the door. That, uh, yeah, well, the hatches um, opened, and they could be locked just uh, 20 millimeters open. 
So you were still protected if you were in combat, but you could have the hatch open. Fair enough. Uh, let's see, pistol ports to the rear, I guess, just in case the natives yes. got a little bit restless. And I do note that there are two footrests for the commander. So I guess he can keep his legs clear and safe. The seat folds down so he can stand on the turret floor for looking at the roof. A simple two-piece hatch. Now that got yes. replaced later. They went to a, um, a thicker armor cupola. So it's a bigger cupola on the outside, not no change on the inside. And then you get a single hatch on that. And eventually the final version had a swivel hatch that swiveled to the side, a single piece. And you'd find that presumably on the J's or something? J's, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I don't have much else to say about the commander's position. I mean, it, it's not ideal, but I've been in worse. All right, well, let's, uh, let me hop over to the gunner's seat and we'll see what he's got. All right, now Hillary's just showing off. We've moved one step to the left each and he is sitting quite comfortably on the commander's Perfect. seat. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, depression era crowds obviously didn't have the problems that you have. You ate too much groceries over the years. <laughs> yeah, blame my mother. I always wanted me to eat the vegetables. All right, so the gunner's seat on the left-hand side, he's got a couple of things going to him. One, as already mentioned, he's on his own. And two, with a 1.6 meter turret ring, this is one of the largest going. It's bigger even than Churchill's and Cromwell's of the late war era, which were, you know, this is 63 inches. How were they able to make it so wide? Well, part of the whole design, as we, we looked at the suspension on the outside, it's, it's on the outside of the vehicle. There's nothing underneath. Mm -hmm. So they were able to use the space in the vehicle and they put fuel tanks underneath the turret okay. platform. So you've got 30 centimeters, one foot of fuel tank. And that raises the whole thing up and that allows you enough height over the tracks that you can put the sponsons out over the tracks. And that's how they achieved the large turret ring. And that was there from day one mm. on the first models back in the mid thirties. And underneath me are the fuel tanks, not ammo and most tanks. And to the front, of course, the site for the gun. Now, as you say, we start off with a 24. We go to a 43 and a 48. Mm -hmm. uh, the realization that we need a bigger gun happened when? Well, it came with the uh, meeting of the T-34 in Russia. They realized that the long, even the long five centimeter gun was uh, not sufficient, but they had the Rheinmetall L43 and then they discovered they could increase that by five lengths up to L48. And it was a very, very accurate gun. And it became virtually the standard gun for most uh, vehicles, including the Sturmgeschütz. The basic uh, length of the gun and, and design was all somewhat similar. Okay. And the ammunition, uh, oh, Panzer Grenade 39, 40, and then HE. Yes. Uh, anything else? Smoke the Spring Granata uh, 34 is the uh, HE. Uh, and then you had um, also for the, well, for the short gun, they had a um, hollow charge round in, in th at the end. They also carried hollow charge round uh, in these for when they encountered uh, heavy vehicles like the uh, Stalin. So in theory, a 48 could destroy a Stalin from the front with, with the hollow charge round? Yes. Hmm. All right, so oh, they also had the uh, Tungsten uh, AP-40s, high velocity uh, sub-caliber round if they had the tungsten available. So yeah, well, they always yeah. carried a certain number of those rounds. Uh, was there ever any attempt to put one of the squeeze bore guns into a Panzer IV? Yes, there, were, there was uh, There was experiments on all of these things. There was, a, there was an experimental one of these, but they stopped that fairly quickly. All right, back to the gun. So the gun sight, the TZF-5F, the Germans always had a reputation for excellent clarity of gun sights and excellent gunnery. Mm -hmm any particular reason for that? Was there a special emphasis or was it just that their engineers were very good? Well, they had they had uh, very good optics engineers in lights and Zeiss and that's where all that comes from. They were making very high quality lenses and even today those lenses are much valued in camera equipment. 
The scale is not your traditional crosshair. No crosshairs in a German vehicle. It's a series of triangles that you you do the calculations based on the, what you see on the tri sitting on the top of the triangles. Okay, so Traverse Systems. We have a motor, an, an auxiliary motor drives an electrical engine. Yeah, I'd be some behind you there now in the motor compartment where Turt pointing straight ahead. Um, behind you, you have an auxiliary motor which is running a generator which is powering the electric motor which is hanging down in front of your knees there. Right. And you can select either manual or the electric motor. So for... By use of this hand on the motor. Yeah, so for fast traverse you'd use the electric motor and then I guess most skill gunners would uh, change over to manual for the final. Which is this little little crank here. It's simple enough. I see it goes. It, it operates a chain which goes to this. Well, maybe that's a cog system to the turret ring. That goes to the car, turret ring. Yeah. All right. So optics. He's got a glass vision port to his front, which I think is good. It means it makes it means that you can see more than a lot of German tanks who just have the the gunner's telescope. I never understood why they never put a periscope in the roof. I mean, the, the Soviets were doing it. They I have no answer it. to that. <laughs> <laughs> Another meeting you were not at. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Side visor here. And I, I guess I guess I can't really use it very much. I mean, what would you yeah, use it? Yeah, it's, it's you've got a odd place. Yeah, uh, uh, when the um, maybe in the earlier version where there was more room, you could get in there and see. But it's quite far forward from where you're sitting. I guess you I can always just stick my head at the side yeah. here. Yeah. And if there's a vision block and a glass block in front of that, you know, you've got to put your head in behind the, uh, the telescope to see it. Yeah. What's this, Yogi? That's your signal port. That's where you wave your flags. Ah, well, that's important. No, oh, it was <laughs> up till the Ausrung F, which is really the same tank as the Ausrung G. Um, just the gun is different. The G has a long gun. Um, but with the, uh, the F was the first one that didn't depend on that for signaling to other tanks. Uh, would they have uh, an issue flare guns? Uh, signal ammunition is... Oh, well, very conveniently located right here, right there. there. So we can pop this open and you can see the... Uh, it doesn't pop open. <laughs> <laughs> I had it open earlier, but... Yeah. All right, so the site is graduated for the Panzergrenade 39 to 2,500 meters. And again, as you're saying, the Germans have this reputation for accuracy. So if the gun can shoot 2,500 meters, the site can shoot 2,500 meters, you see a target at 2,500 meters, you fire, you will kill it? You should hit it. Should. Should, but um, there are studies on the number of rounds that were needed to uh, hit a target and uh, it's surprisingly high. I've seen figures of 18 rounds being needed to fire to hit a target during the Second World War on average. Uh, I guess and the Germans were actually better than most at hitting the targets. I guess getting shot back at tends to put you off your aim a little. Ah, uh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so operation of the gun, as we've already mentioned, we have the selector for manual or powered. The two controls are to the front. I have to say the system is very well balanced. I can very easily hand crank one way or the other. Foot trigger uh, will set the round off. And well, judging by the size of the basket, I'd say yeah, maybe 15 or 20 rounds before your basket is filled and you got to eject the port, uh, the spent shell casings at the side port. Uh, travel lock is directly to my front, it is missing, and I think that's pretty much it for the gunner seat, so uh, let's talk ammo. Greetings! Just a reminder, if you are not yet a player of World of Tanks, the free game, because it's not going to cost you anything to try it out, have a look at the text description below the video here. Download it, try it out, let us know if you like it. That was it. See you on the next one. How do you get 2.6? <laughs> Another meeting I wasn't at. <laughs> okay, well, I think we've about covered the uh, loader's position here.